welcome everybody to the Kona Shame Veterinary Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Andy Roy. Guys, I am here with one of my dear good friends, Dr. Jessica Vogelsang. She is amazing. She is one of those people who really makes me think. We are talking about, is it time to decenter the veterinarian from veterinary care? Don't have an aneurysm. Just, it's a very provocative title. It is a very good grounded discussion that's probably not going to panic anybody but it is a good place to start thinking about what care should look like in the future and the role of veterinarians going forward so anyway i really enjoy this i hope you guys are going to get it and get a lot out of it it's just really smart to start thinking about what practice going forward will look like i think there's some really good practical actionable tips in here yeah i hope you guys will enjoy it I'm going to stop talking now and let you guys get into the episode. Let's go. This is your show. We're glad you're here. We want to help you in your veterinary career. Welcome to the Cone of Shame with Dr. Andy Rourke. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Jessica Vogelsang. How are you? Hello. I'm good. How are you? I am good. It's good to have you back on the podcast. The last time you were here, we were talking about the retention study from the American Animal Hospital Association. For those who don't know you, you are the chief medical officer at the American Animal Hospital Association. But we're not talking about AHA stuff specifically today. You and I have just been kicking around some ideas recently, and I said, what are you excited to, to talk about? And you, one of the ideas that you had that uh, you've been thinking about that immediately got me interested and excited was the idea that it may be time to decenter the DVM from the delivery of veterinary services. Did I quote you correctly on that? Do you believe that it might be time to decenter? What do you even mean when you say that? When you think about models of care, right? Who is the primary decision maker? Who directs the whole cycle of care? In human medicine, they've gotten away from this sort of physician-centered care, and they talk about patient-centered care. And so the patient is at the the center of the wheel, and there's all these different little hub and spokes. You have your nursing care, your doctors, your specialists, and and they all coordinate together to funnel into this patient. And in veterinary medicine, I I think we we think we work that way, but in actuality, we don't. We're still very Mm DVM-centered. And really what actually represented this for me and got me thinking about it was I was looking at something actually about telehealth and the VCPR. And there was a diagram about how, you know, care is delivered to patients, but it's still the vet at the center of it. Um, And the patient was kind of off on the side. Oh, they're talking to this person, they're talking to that person. But why is that the patient at the center? And so it started this whole sort of rabbit hole that I went down asking questions about, do we actually perform team-based medicine um, in veterinary medicine? So you can look at it in different ways. There's, it's all going at the same thing, but in order to provide really patient-centered care, you need a team-based approach, which involves the veterinarian sort of decentering themselves from being the one and only person through which all information and decisions are funneled. And that's- yeah. Very hard for many, many reasons, as I've been learning over the last year, but it's an important conversation for us to have. When we start to talk about this and the idea that it is possible to have the patient in the center of the of the spoken wheel, if you will, it, it seems like there's pretty fundamental changes there. So before I start to ask too many questions about this, can you paint me a picture, Jessica, of what this might actually look like in practice? What would the experience be like in an imaginary vet hospital that has this decentered DVM approach, they have the patient in the center of the wheel. How did how does that how does that even look? There's sort of different uh, layers of the onion, right? Like part of it is just what happens inside the clinic. Um, part of it is are you plugged into the community, right? To to other people who have a stake in this person, in their family, in their lives. But in inside the clinic itself really in terms of workflow at its most basic level, it is a veterinarian doing the things for which a DVM is required. So Mm -hmm. diagnosing, prescribing, prognosing, performing surgery, and your team does really everything else. That is it at its most fundamental core. That is the, the core of workplace efficiency, leveraging your technicians. As a profession, I think that's been our first 
sort of dig into exploring this is in the conversation surrounding technician utilization. Okay, well, what does that mean? It means that the technician does everything that they're legally allowed to do, depending on your state practice act. And then the veterinarian just does the stuff that that they need to do. And even that one little thing, you immediately run into a brick wall. How do I trust that they're going to do it? Yeah. Why do we have veterinarians out there writing prescriptions? Do they need to actually be like, you, they need to be the one to determine what the prescription is, but they, do they need to be the one to enter it into the record? Do they yeah. need to be the, the one to like process. count yeah. out the pills? And some people say yes, some people say no. So how do you even begin to have those conversations about truly understanding roles and responsibilities? How do you delegate? And once you decide, yes, I know that this is what this person should do, do I trust them to do it? And if not, why not? Who is responsible for determining if that person has the right skill sets? Uh, who's liable if they don't do it right? There's a lot of things yeah. that separate how veterinary medicine works from human medicine. So it's not like you can just go up to a vet and say, just trust sure. them, it's fine. But sure. it's worth going down that hole and, and trying to, to play it out. I mean, there are clinics that function that way. I was talking with Mark Thompson. He's the, the president of AHA this year. And he, I think he sees 50 patients a day. And I, I couldn't get my head around that. 50 patients a day. He works from nine to five and everybody leaves on time. I think his technician to DVM ratio is, is something it's like eight to one or something. Oh, wow. Don't quote me on that. But it, it's because he leverages everyone in their hilt. But it's taken yeah. him 25 years of practice to get to that workflow. And he knows that he's certainly the exception. But yeah. that's what we're shooting for. Would you say that the sort of stereotypical dentist, human dentist, is kind of an example of what this might look like. There's When you're talking about decentering the, the DVM, there's always this question I think that comes into people's minds. And I think that's why they react really strongly to this is, yeah. how decentered are we talking about? Is it the veteran, is that guy a veteran, uh, dentist, dental hygienist relationship? Or is it there's a vet in a building two cities away and a technician here with the pet? And that's how decentered the veterinarian is. That's why it gets scary, right? And yeah. we're not talking about like direct versus indirect supervision, anything like that. Like certainly you still like the veterinarian has oversight of what's happening. And so it's not about lack of oversight, right? It's not about taking decisions away that the, the veterinarian is legally obligated to make. But it, it's about when you're at the center, everything goes through you. Everything. Does everything need to go through you? Certainly a lot of stuff needs to, but does everything. Do you need to be the one to go through follow-up instructions? Do you need to be the one, like I said, to like count out the individual pills and check off that it was filled right? Like I, I, it, there, there's a happy medium in there somewhere. And I think we haven't quite figured out what that is. So that's what I mean by decentered. And when decisions are being made, are we taking into account all of the other factors? Uh, when you talk about patient-centered veterinary medicine, so it's not just about who's making the decisions, but what are they thinking about when they make the decisions? So, you know, as a veterin as veterinarians, we're trained oftentimes to look at the patient in front of us and recommend things that have better in the best interest medically of, of the patient. But all of the conversations that we're having now around spectrum of care, contextualized care, requires you to take a little bit more of a step back and to say there are other confounding layering factors on there about finances, about accessibility. Is the client able to do the things that that you're recommending just physically yeah. or mentally? And so can you leverage your team to help have some of those conversations and have some understanding so that you're making recommendations that are really family centered? It's complex. And yeah. you are never going to be able to get to that model if you're the one who has to make every little decision. Like it's exhausting. Yeah, it's, it's, not, not work. It's, it's not feasible. It's not sustainable. Do you think that pet owners are open to this type of practice or do you yes. think? And again, I know we're speaking in about broad generalities here, mm -hmm. but whenever I bring this, because I, I, you and I are pretty much in alignment, I think, for, based on this conversation of how I think practices should run or what they look like in the future and what makes sense. One of the big, biggest pieces of pushback that I receive is Pet owners won't allow that. They want to talk to the veterinarian. They want to know what the veterinarian thinks. They want to... Who created that environment? I agree. I agree. My first day in the clinic, I was a brand new grad. Uh, so I had practice for exactly zero hours at that time. And I show up and my mentor's there. 
And what does he do? So the first thing that happens is my name tag isn't printed yet. So my name tag still has my maiden name as a student of veterinary medicine. And oh. the first thing he does is say, wear that. I'm like, that's not going to help. That's a terrible and, idea. And every time we walked in the room, he introduced me as the brand new grad who didn't know anything. Oh. So oh. of course they're going to want to talk to him. Yeah. You have set the expectation that this person doesn't know what they're doing. And it's the same with your staff. How are we introducing our technicians and our front desk staff? Is this is the person who knows so much more about financial plans than I do. This is our absolute maestro at dental care. This is our technician who does this day in, day out. She is going to teach you everything you need to know. There is zero pushback about taking advice from someone if you let the client know this is who I trust and this is who you should trust too. That's, that's it. It's about yeah. trust. So when you look at some of the surveys out there about telehealth, people are complaining about going to Dr. Google and all that kind of stuff. They're not going there because they like Dr. Google more. They're going there because you've been inaccessible for the most part. And so we know that the studies have proven in human medicine and veterinary medicine, people preferentially that their number one most trusted source of information is their vet mm. in the vet clinic. Number two is any vet. And number three is the random public. If you make yourself and by proxy, your team accessible, that's who they're going to go to first. I see no barriers there other than the ones that we've created ourselves. I like that a lot. I think your statement about how we introduce our support team is, I think you're spot on. I, I don't think that's ever been more relevant. The, the thought that was sort of in my mind is we sort of talk about de decentering the vet and what that looks like. I always sort of swing back and forth. I don't think I'm indecisive, but I think I tend to lean one way and then evaluate my views and then kind of wait, lean back the other way. And it's, for a long time, I'd always said, said you know, we, we really need to sort of decentralize the vet. We really need to, vet medicine is a team game. And I still do believe that. As I look around the world, I can't help but notice influencer culture really growing and spreading like crazy. And whether you're into TikTok or Instagram or whether you're just watching on TV, I mean, I'll give you an example. We have Snoop Dogg at the Olympics right now as we're recording this. And he had that on their bingo card no, 10 years ago. Not at all. Not at all. And even more shockingly, he's crushing it. People love him. People who you wouldn't think love him. My mom loves him. And boy, she, she, she didn't like him when I played his no. music in the 90s. No. She was not about it at and, all. And the man knows more about dressage than I do. Yeah, his, his dressage coverage was amazing. <laughs> but so all that to say, I promise there's a point here. <laughs> the point here is we have this influencer culture where people are going and they're saying, oh, this individual is great. I really like them. I really like what they have to say. And that's all TikTok and Instagram and things are, are these short sort of video clips of people talking to the camera and stuff like that. We see people building these audiences. We see them building credibility. We know that TikTok has surpassed Google in the first place that young people go to find information, which blows my mind, they search TikTok. And, and so I'm looking at that and I go, okay, if this is how the world is going and people are leaning more and more into what do these, I don't know, famous figures, these people I pseudo know, what do they say? What do they think? I can't help but wonder a little bit, are we shooting ourselves in the foot if we move veterinarians out of the public spotlight. Does that make sense? I want to be really, really careful when I say decentering. Again, it doesn't mean that you're not present in a way that you were before. Like one, it's about efficiency, but two, really decentering also has to do with, with your prioritization and decision making. It's about making decisions that are, are truly driven by the needs and priorities of the patient rather than necessarily just what you think. And so when a client comes in and they have all this stuff they found on TikTok, you have to take that into account in your yeah. conversations, which is really hard for people. Um, so again, it is centering them. And here they, they went and did that for a reason. There's some reason that they came in thinking that raw food's the way to go. Or mm -hmm. and, and if you immediately discount that and say, that's stupid and I know better, that then they're going to shut down. Yeah. Because you, you have to center them as the, the person who knows themselves and their pet best. They may not know the medicine the best, but they know their lives best. And so really, to me, that's what centering means. So it, it doesn't matter what you would do in that situation. And that's why it's always funny when someone asks, what would you do? It doesn't necessarily always really matter what I would do because I'm not you and I have 
different resources and, and needs and priorities. To me, that's really what about the centering means. And so yeah. I, I think the reason that people love influencers so much is that influencers are really, really good at centering the viewer in those conversations. I know this is what you care about and here's my thoughts on it. And you don't have to play the same game or be on TikTok. You just have to take the same approach. I know this is what you care about. This is my recommendation. And again, you don't have to be the only one having that conversation. I yeah. guarantee that there are probably 75% of your clinic who's more adept at TikTok and knows these influencers more than you do. I think you totally blew my mind. What I thought you were going to say was if we introduce our staff and we endorse them, you can have the veterinarian being this influencer type figure, the person who, you know, who has the relationship, but then delegates effectively to the team and does so by bringing up their status in the eyes of the pet owner. And you can still have this almost like a PR veterinary centered experience. And that's where I thought you were going to go. You did not go there. You completely flipped it on its head. And I really love your answer much more than what I was thinking you were probably going to say. And, and the idea of the idea that influencers do a great job because they center the viewer, meaning they create this content that makes the viewer feel seen and feel special and feel important. I think that's probably the answer. And so I think it's suddenly it makes a lot of sense going back to sort of your original idea of the patient slash client as the center of the care wheel, as opposed to the veterinarian the center of the care wheel. I, I think what does our engagement with the public, what is our marketing, what is our public relations, what does that stuff look like? if we put the patient slash client in the center of everything and we make this client based care environment, I think that's, I think that's a really good answer. I'm going to, I have to sit with that as far as what it looks like, but can I you write that down for works. me? You just explained it really well. <laughs> I'm still processing. I'm like, Oh, I thought, well, really, I, I, I think that your take on it is, is really, I think that's really good. I'm really going to sit and, and think with that. It's, I think you're probably spot on. I think that you can a hundred percent lean into everything that we've been talking about, about decentering the veterinarian and still creating the experience yep. that the pet owner is looking for. I think it's quite possible that the pet owner thinks that they want the veterinarian's attention. The truth is the pet owner wants to feel seen and heard and listened to. They want to feel reassured and safe. And if we create that experience for them, then magically direct FaceTime with the veterinarian for an extended period of time becomes a lot less important. I think if you ask them what they want, they're going to tell you, I want an hour with the veterinarian. I don't think that they really do. And I think if you show them a healthy alternative, they'll just let that idea go. Well, and, and to take it even a step further, I would say what they really want is to know that they did the right thing at the end of the day. Yeah. It is not about, I want you to fix this. I want to know that I did the right thing by coming to you. Mm -hmm. I want to know that I did the right thing by following your recommendations. Yeah. No, I, I think you're I think you're right. I think there's a big validation component. And I think if they could probably receive that validation from the team, then that would relieve that tension or that feeling of I need more time with the veterinarian. I think in order for them to receive that validation, we have to do a good job of giving our team a reputation of setting them up for success in the pet owner's eyes for making them for making the pet owner feel like our team is a worthy source of validation. You know what I mean? You, yep. I, I, I want to be validated by an expert. And if I don't believe you're an expert, then your validation doesn't mean that much to me. But if I do believe you are an expert, you're knowledgeable, you're someone that I respect, then that validation is great. I think we have to make sure that our team falls into that expert category in order yeah. for all of this to work. This reference is going to be like super dated by the time this comes out. But Simone Biles, greatest of all time, bowed to Rebecca Andrade when she won the gold medal. Yeah, you're the greatest, but also like in this, somebody else did really, really exceptional. It doesn't take anything away from you to acknowledge that yeah. and to celebrate it in front of the world. Actually, it makes you stronger. It makes the entire sport of gymnastics stronger. It makes the entire profession stronger for us to have that message. Like when you come into the clinic, yeah, like, look, I'm great. I know you love me. And also this team that I work with every day is also amazing. I wouldn't work with them if they didn't. Yeah. We are here to make sure you leave feeling like you did the right thing. Yeah. What do you think is the main driver of 
push back against this? Because this is not a new concept, the idea of using our technicians like dentists use their hygienists. None of this is new. I think that perspectives are changing. I think that there are significant incentives for us to get more efficient today than there were 10 years ago. There's still pushback. Where do you think that pushback primarily comes from? Yeah, it's interesting, you know, depending on who you ask. And when we were working on the technician utilization guidelines, the technicians were saying, why don't you trust us? It's that you don't think we know how to do a good job. Uh And the veterinarian said, well, no, it's not that. It's I'm worried about liability. So I I think a lot of it is about the, the perception of whose responsibility is it to ensure that this person is actually doing those things that you're delegating to them and that they're trained appropriately to do so. That was sort of like an aha moment for me where I know for me as an associate, because it's happened to me, it's happened to a lot of my colleagues. You're an associate. I know that I'm working with this credential technician and that I'm being told that they're trained in order to do X, Y, Z. But if something goes off the rails, I'm still the one who's going to be liable in court. My license is online. That makes it really, really hard if I don't truly believe in my heart of hearts that you've seen this and that you know how, how to do it. And it's not the same on the human side. If you go to the hospital and the nurse pulls up the wrong medication and administers it to you and, and something bad happens, it's the hospital who, who carries the liability. So I think there's some fundamental ways that we address that. That's like legal and that's all this other stuff and that's cultural, that it's going to take us a while to untangle. But that's real. Like that fear is real. So I get why it's really hard for for veterinarians, especially when you're not the one who has oversight as to how the rest of the team is being trained. And so it's going to take some time. It's certainly not a matter of just flipping it off and on switch, right? It's it's a lot of teamwork. It's a lot of um, transparency in terms of very specific core competencies. That It's really great conversations that organizations are having right now. There, there's different levels of assistants and technicians and registered technicians all the way up to specialists. What does that mean? What exactly are those skill sets and how have they been validated? And I think as we build those out and everybody has a much clearer understanding of what they are, that's going to make it easier for us to trust and to delegate. But that's going to take some time. Dr. Jessica Vogel saying, thanks for being here. Where can people find you online? Where can they see what you're up to with the American Animal Hospital Association? At aha.org. Awesome. Thank you so much. Guys, thanks for tuning in and listening. I hope you had I hope you had fun. I hope you got some good ideas to roll around like I did. Take care of yourselves, everybody. And that's what I got. Guys, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. Thanks to Dr. Jessica Vogelsang from the American Animal Hospital Association for being here and kicking ideas back and forth with me. She is she's amazing. I just so enjoy her. I so enjoy you as well. Thanks for tuning in. Take care of yourselves, everybody. I'll talk to you soon. <laughs>